afternoon and welcome to Birdland Media Works. I'm your host, Danielle Pai, and today I'm joined by Jamie Gee. Jamie Gee is a guitar virtuoso playing everything from Bach to Broadway and flamenco to rock. Gee has been a musician for more than 45 years and has backed groups such as The Temptations, The Four Tops, Little Ava, Peggy March, Johnny Thunder, Dee Dee Sharp, Danny and the Juniors, The Shirelles, Joey D and the Starlighters, The Coasters, The Platters, and The Marvelettes. She's also played with the Florida West Coast Symphony Orchestra, the Sarasota Pops, Irby Mann, and several Broadway shows, including The Man of La Mancha, Kiss Me Kate, and Dream Girls. When she isn't playing, she teaches more than 60 students a week. Jamie Gee also happens to be transgender and is an advocate for transgender awareness and education. Jamie, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me, Danielle. Now, Jamie, from what I understand, you knew the exact moment you decided to become a musician. Can you talk a little bit about that inspiration? (laughs) I sure can. February 9th, 1964 at 8 (laughs) o'clock. Wow, that's pretty specific. (laughs) That's really specific. That was the night the the Beatles came on Ed Sullivan's show. And I'll never forget it. It was just mesmerizing. It was, we were all, I was 10. And I sat there and it's like... Wow, with my sisters and family members, our house had a bunch of people in it, and everybody was, the older folks were making fun of them, and us young people were going, like myself, those are boys with long hair, cool clothes, <laughs> guitars. Well, it didn't take long after that. After that, they got the hint. I took one of Dad's cigar boxes and put rubber bands on it, and I was strumming. So you hadn't had a guitar before that. That inspired mm. you to start playing for the period. Right there and then. Wow. And so then, I'll never forget it, I was in the basement and I took one of my dad's pool sticks and I tied it up to the ceiling so it was like a microphone. <laughs> and I was singing with my little box and mom was watching and laughing. And then right after that, uh, then my next birthday, I, was, uh, I got my first acoustic guitar. And then that was a mission. <laughs> it was a real mission. I mean, it was like nobody played. There was nothing. I had no internet. There was nothing. So you taught yourself from the beginning. You had to. I would watch anything. And back in those days, we had four channels on TV, ABC, NBC, CBS, and PBS. That was it. And so (laughs) anything that had a band or musicians, I would be glued. I used to look forward to Lawrence Welk show on Sundays because they had a guitar player and I could watch, maybe catch something. But one of the ways I was able to catch or learn a few things was to buy Beatle cards. And I would look at the pictures and see and put my fingers there and say, it sounds cool. I don't know what it is, but it's cool. And so I did that. And tuning the guitar was, was, was a major trip. I was so ignorant. I remember going to the store with my parents and there was a guitar on the wall. And I went to the guy, is that guitar in tune? He goes, yeah. So I I got a little piece of paper and a pencil, and I I put the direction of each key on the guitar. So maybe if I turned mine the same way, (laughs) my guitar would be in tune. But of course, I got home and put them the way they were, and it didn't work. So it was very difficult. You had to really want to play. I was going to say, that's determination. So now where did you actually get your start? Was there one venue or person who just gave you a shot? Well, you first get your start after you see that. Then you first get your start with uh, the family. You have to start performing in front of your family. <laughs> At every Aunt holiday. And then every holiday. <laughs> get the guitar and play for auntie and play for uncle. And So that's how you get your, st- you get your chops. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next thing is that when you really get an- enough going, then you start, you, you start doing free things. That's really important. Uh, one of the most important things in this business is you do free things and they'll cultivate paying gigs. And so, of course, uh, supermarket openings, any kind of block party, uh, any kind of cousin's birthday, whatever there was, I would play, you know. And so you did that, and then next thing you know, it you you, you get your you start your lessons, and you you know you go and you start learning tunes. And of course, I had to learn all the Beatles songs, and then it was Rolling Stones, and then Jimi Hendrix came on the scene. So when I finally turned like eighteen, I had to have get a job, and that's when it started to get okay. I need a serious gig here now. I need to play with people who make a living at this. And then once again, you start in the ranks. You're young, and you'll play for anything. Uh, whatever the pay is at the time, God, I remember a minimum wage was a dollar, dollar ten an hour. Oh, wow. <laughs> so that was when the turning point is because back in my day, uh, when you turned eighteen, there was no college for us. You know, I'm, I'm the firstborn of a, an Italian family from Italy. Mm-hmm. 
So there was no college. So the thing was, you go out to work. And so I had a little part-time job and then start beating the streets at night, getting going to auditions and all that stuff, you know. And then being in New York, it was like, okay, I'd go for an audition for like a really national act and there'd be 200 guitar cases in front of me, <laughs> better than the next. So that was discouraging. So uh, it was time to leave the Big Apple and, uh, you know, go out. And so I got a gig with a band that was on on the road. And I did that uh, for quite a few years and traveled around the country and ended up playing in Vegas and then coming back to Tampa. You know, so, well, actually, my parents moved to Florida, so I had to go and visit them. So the next thing you know it, I was playing all over you know, the, the whole uh, eastern seaboard uh, and was doing that for many, many years up until I was like t- 25, and that's when I, I got married and had my first child. You know. Now, you talked a little bit about the preparation and training, but at some point, did you go for formal training to learn how to read music? I had some at the time. I'll never forget it. It was at Brown's Music in Long Island, and uh, it was $3 a, a session, a lesson back then. And the only problem was was I wanted to learn how to play songs that were popular. And, you know, they take you the old traditional, you know, read the notes and play Mary Had a Little Lamb, and you do all that. So I got frustrated with that. And I kind of pretty much stayed on my own because at this time, when we got into like junior high school, high school, other kids were playing and we were like teaching each other, you mm-hmm. know, so we will teach, hey, I learned this part of the song. Oh, that's great. I know this part of the song. And we would get together. I had my first uh, uh, group uh, was for the seventh grade talent show band, which was <laughs> amazing. And what's funny today is uh, we, we meet every year now uh, and we play for our high school reunion. Uh, this is number 46 coming up with the original 7th grade talent show. Oh, that's band. awesome. <laughs> we all meet, Stephanie, Glenn, and I, and, and all the kids from like 4th grade on up. We all meet every year and uh, out in Tremays in Long Island. I mean, it happens to be owned by a, a girlfriend of mine that I got busted in the 8th grade. <laughs> and she owns this great Did you jazz. put gum in her hair in the 8th grade? <laughs> So she owns this great jazz and blues club, and I'm like, and it's, so it's a big thing. I go back every year, and everybody meets there. And when I, I, we have the whole weekend, we we party together and just play the old songs, and it's really hilarious, you know, to get back and see everybody, you know. What a great connection. Yeah. <laughs> now you touched on it a little bit, but from a business perspective, what kind of challenges have you had to overcome to get where you are today? The most important point about that is you have to. The most important class I took in high school that I pay attention to was a business class. You have to learn to sell yourself. You have to learn to be a salesperson. Uh, you have to have people like you. And the other thing is you have to play variety. You have to be able. If someone says they want to hear Havana Gila, there you go. <laughs> And if somebody wants to hear Spanish romance, you better have something under your belt. And so in the business sense, like now, um, I've been in this so long now, I get calls all the time. And uh, But it took many years to get to that stage. You know, in business sense, is you need to go to clubs. You need to get involved with the local musicians. You need to get involved with the local music stores. Hey, what's happening? You go around. Like if I want to play, like I wanted to play the Don Cesar. Uh, when I was in Tampa, and that place was hard to get into. So I went and had lunch there until they got to know me. Mm-hmm. And they started to see I was a regular. And then the food and beverage manager got to know me, mm-hmm. got to like me. And this is how I infiltrated. <laughs> and so next Very thing you know, it's like, hey, you know, I've been coming. I, I got a little band. Oh, really? And then next thing you know, you go in. And the thing is, he said, well, we only pay so much. And that's, I said, and I go, well, that's just fine. I'll play for whatever you have. But if they want me back, yeah. then it's going to cost them. Yeah. So yeah. I go in and I'll go in like gangbusters. You know, I'll just put on a, a heck of a good show. And the next thing you know, it, you know, it's like, well, we want you back. I said, now it's $100 an hour. Yeah. You, know? <laughs> you got first one free. Now it's going right, to cost you. First one. So that's how basically, and you have to do it. And networking is really important. Uh, you need to patronize the places that have entertainment. You need to go around and, 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 Really get to know your local musicians that are playing professionally because that's how you, oh, hey, I need to substitute. I do a lot of substituting. I substitute with about a half a dozen bands, and it's really fun. You know, then all of a sudden, one week I'm playing in a glam rock band, the next weekend I'm playing an oral girl rock and roll band, mm-hmm. and then the next weekend after that I'm playing a jazz band and a trio or a duo, <laughs> and it's really fun. And it's like it all snowballs. 
Yeah. You know, so, and that's really the most important thing is you have to get involved with the community. Yeah. And it didn't happen overnight. So it's no, not, it a lot of people think they're going to go out the door and that you started when you no. were, you know, a uh, teenager. When I started once again, it was, I played VFWs. I, I remember my aunt asking me to, to play at the, uh, the Loyal Order. I called it the Loyal Order of the Water Buffaloes. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> all those kind of things, the Moose Lodge and all yeah. that. And I play and I still do. Uh, I still today, uh, I'll be turning 62 in March. I still play for the American veterans. I play for them uh, just uh, uh, for Veterans Day. And it's really great. You yeah. know, it's like I still do all that same stuff that I've been doing pretty much my whole life. Yeah. You know, and now what I like is I get a chance to, uh, uh, to teach. And teaching is really a blast because I've been playing now for professionally over you know, 50 years. And now it's like passing the torch to young people. Yeah. And I have five-year-olds doing stuff on the guitar I didn't do till I was 14 years old. I have a 13-year-old prodigy, uh, Caleb. Amazing. The kid just turned 13 and he can substitute for me. He can read charts. He plays country. He plays rock. He plays jazz. And he's getting geared to make a living out of it. And isn't technology an amazing thing? Because now you have the internet. You can get lessons from everywhere and you have that at your it's fingertips. absolutely amazing. What got me was growing up, there were so many things we heard about. You know, Jimi Hendrix lighting his guitar on fire at the Monterey Pop Festival, Rolling Stones, this and that. And now all of a sudden here, I got this little thing, <laughs> my phone, for God's sakes, and type in Jimi Hendrix at the Monterey Pop Festival, and here it comes. Everything. Yeah. I was like, this is amazing. Seeing stuff now that you had to be at Woodstock to see. Being able to learn stuff that I would have to pay thousands of dollars to find a person who could show me how to do intricate yeah. playing. And now I just go on that thing, sit down. It's like, okay, show me some cool jazz licks. And yeah. thousands come up. I'm like, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> now, what do you love best about your career? Is I get totally blessed when I get to play places and people smile and they have a great time. Yeah. Uh, that's really the... The, the payoff for me. Uh, I've played in front of thousands and see them all jumping and cheering and I've played gigs where there'd be four or five people. And it's just, and they're all great. Yeah. Uh, the, the big thrill, I get a chance to travel. I still get a chance to play with uh, great people. Last summer, for my 61st birthday, I played with Gloria Estefan, Vanessa Williams, Rita Moreno at the uh, Adrian Arts Center in Miami. And I never know what's going to happen next. So yeah. next thing you know, it, I got calls. I'm playing with this wonderful new church on Sunday morning, asked me. I have uh, the Unitarian churches uh, asked me to perform there. Uh, I got a, I'm doing a concert at the MCC Cathedral in Venice. Uh, that's in uh, January, uh, February, excuse me. And I'm just amazed. I mean, I get to do this. I get to be on cruise ships. I travel the world playing music. And I made money at it. It didn't cost me thousands of dollars to go to South Africa. It didn't cost me thousands of dollars to go to, you know, uh, the Latin countries and the, and the Caribbeans. I had a great time and I made money. <laughs> <laughs> you had a great time. You did what you love and you yeah. got paid to do it. I That's a pretty good life. It. And it was like, <laughs> wow. This is, and so the same thing. I, right now I'm getting to the point now where uh, I'm in Sarasota and I got another year, a few years, I'm going to re retire. And what that means is... I'm going to be retiring so I can go out on cruise ships again <laughs> and enjoy As a guest. myself and play. <laughs> and, you know, if I want to go on the road for a few months, I'm going to go out on the road. And I get to see beautiful places. I get to go and meet wonderful people. I mean, next thing you know, it, it's like these people come up and they're so thrilled that, about your playing and whatever you're singing. They invite you. They, they want to be around you, yeah. you know. Now, what advice would you give to aspiring musicians today? Okay, you really want to know the truth about yeah. that? All right, because of the internet and everything that's going on, when I first started playing, nobody knew anything about the guitar. I mean, it was just, uh, it wasn't available. Uh, nobody knew anything about, you know, anything because there was no information going around, especially nobody played guitar. And so the, the thing is, now, because of the internet, you have to be very diverse. You have to really, really know your stuff. And so now, like my young students now, I'm getting them prepared to play everything. And they really need to take the time to learn their craft, learn the instrument, 
learn to sing, learn every kind of music that there is, because our country is based on that. And so I had a person come in, and they were from India, and I happened to know one because I listened to Ravi Shankar. <laughs> <laughs> back in the 60s and they were like amazed and so once again getting yourself prepared to, to, to go out there and do it you need to be very diverse and you need to know what you're doing you need to know your theory and whatnot on a different note you are a well-known representative of the transgender community and an advocate for education in a recent interview you mentioned that you received death threats and at least 25 transgender people were murdered in 2017 Personally, I believe people fear what they don't understand, but yet I look at that and wonder why. Uh, do you get a sense of why there is so much violence and opposition to people who are transgender? Well, I didn't get anything like that, but I, I kind of came up with some, a couple of formulations, okay? Um, the first thing is there's the people who wish they can transition, but they can't. They will lose their whole life, and I did. I lost mine. I lost great family. I lost great, you know, everything. I lost a great job. lost lost gigs you know and so i have the point to where it's like the ones who really hate hate us i think they really want to be or they're they're gay and they can't come to terms with it so they really hate you for it and that's tough you know and then you have the the extremist people um the religious people and not just uh, the Christian people, but all of them, uh, even the Jewish. I gotten grief from a, a, a Jewish rabbi. I've gotten told by pastors. I've been told by priests. Um, I get uh, people come on my message me about uh, different verses in the Bible, and you know, and in their heart they are so trying to help me. So I I will go to heaven, and they miss the whole point of. Uh, you know, of the religion thing. First of all, I only live by, I have a Savior who saved me from all my sins. Mm -hmm. So whether I'm right or wrong, can I wait till I talk to him about it? I go by the one and only commandment. Love thy God with all thy mind and love thy neighbor as thyself. That means everybody. Whether they're poor, whether they're rich, just be nice to everybody. Because that's what's going to be seen when you've got to go look at your past life. And I feel bad for those religious extremist people because they're going to have to explain to Jesus himself why they were so hateful in his name. I don't want that. I want him to like me. <laughs> that's why I'm practicing the guitar hard so I can say, okay, I think I'm kind of ready for your beginning band. <laughs> and, you, and you raise a really good point. If you're going under the assumption based on your religion that all have sinned, quote unquote right. sinned, and I have my thoughts on that, uh -huh. um, what does it matter if one is more right than uh -huh. another? Right. Exactly. <laughs> you're all going to the same it's place and you all have to be held we're accountable. We're still going to have to see yeah. and be accountable. So I just want him to see that I was nice to people. Good. <laughs> you know, and that's it. <laughs> and make people happy for a little bit when I play. Yeah. You know, and I try to keep it that way. You know, it's like, and I do fall short myself. It's like when I'm driving, I get ticked off at people who come here. <laughs> oh, but I still go. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you should hear me. Uh, my husband hides in the back when I start cursing when my computer doesn't operate. He's like, yes. I'm so glad that's not yes. directed at me, honey. <laughs> right there, you go. It's. Uh... <laughs> so now you're quoted as saying, "No one chooses to be transgender, and nature loves." variations but society does not yes. what would you like society to understand about being transgender well see the thing is the first thing is just we don't choose this we really don't i mean when you're six or seven years old and you don't know why you're putting on your sister's clothes mm. and you feel really great and you feel right and you try so hard like why do i do this you know six and seven you don't know about sex you don't know about anything but yet, this is this magnetism. It amazes me. You can't control yourself. And then as you get older, it gets worse. It's like, I'm not happy being a boy, you know? Mm -hmm. And next thing you know, it, it's like, wow. You get this invisible flashing sign over your head that says, I'm different. And everybody just kind of knows and, you know, put you in a category. Uh, back then, it was like, oh, you're just a queer. <laughs> So you live and you try so hard because of the, the boy thing. You're going to get married, have children. This is what's pumped into your head. And bop, 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 and this and that. You can play sports. And I didn't do any of that. 
I had never played any sports. I clung to uh, my music and drawing. And I really didn't get involved with much in school because there wasn't for people like me at that time. You know, there was nobody like me to talk to in school. Like now when I go to schools and people ask me questions and I do talks. And uh, so there was nothing. I kept my mouth shut. Because if my dad, if I would have came out to my parents, I would have been dead. They would have said, get out. So when when you tried on your sister's clothes, was that without them knowing? Oh, yeah. Every time that they would leave and I was home alone, oh, boy, it was terrific, you know. Mm -hmm. So and having two sisters was great. I had a wardrobe. (laughs) And that's rough because at that time you had no support system and nobody to ask questions to. I had nobody. And the thing was, there must be something wrong with me. Why do I do this? And you feel so alone. You know, it's like, why do I do this? So at what point did you realize this is who I am and I'm sorry if you don't understand that and you really felt like this is right for you? You always feel like that, like you've always been in the wrong body. Mm-hmm. I've always felt like I've been a girl. And, and, but the thing is, because of the conditioning that you get, you know, I went through the paces, you know, got married, had the kids and the house and all that good stuff. And I was just, it was miserable. I'm like, what am I doing? You know, this is this is horrible. I mean, I, 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 it's just a horrible existence, you know. So then I finally had to come to terms with it, which was about eight years ago, mm-hmm. you know. And my ex was just fabulous. I mean, we're still very, very tight because she didn't lose me to another woman. She lost me because I became one. Mm-hmm. And so we're very, very close. And my kids, my two boys, they're great. Uh, they call me Mom Squared. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really fun. I have my nieces and I'm like uh, aunt, uncle. <laughs> Yeah. So and it's okay, and I don't mind. It's you know as long as they're happy with it, right. <laughs> and it's really great. And that's got to have been tough on your ex-wife too. You have to feel a little bit like, well, not that you lost your husband, but you know you you wondered, well, did you love me? There's probably all these questions going on. Well, about- see, the thing is, is, she was very special because she was she was uh, knew about me right from the get go. And so it was fun for us to go, she would dress me up and we'd go to the, the, the clubs, we'd go to the, the gay clubs and it was like our special night out, you know, and it was like, and that was fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, that worked for a, a while. <laughs> so she it, wasn't totally shocked. It, no, she, yeah, not at all. Yeah. I mean, she knew, and it was really funny though, because one time I came out of the, the bathroom, I was getting ready for a gig and I, I came out and I really did, I, I looked really nice, you know, not to brag, but I said, did you ever think I could look so lovely? And she turns around, she goes, yes, you've always been a woman. She goes, it's time for you to move on. I said, yeah. Aww. So it was like, yeah, so we're very, very tight. Yeah. And the kids are tight. And then it was like, okay, next, the big one, the family and friends. Oh, boy. How did that so, go? Well, it went better than I thought. I had my cousin Amy, uh, who's uh, still in New York, and... Uh, I went back to play for, I said, well, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it big time. And so I called up uh, Lori, an old friend who owns the club that I still play at. I said, listen, I want to play, I said, for our reunion. She goes, oh, boy. (laughs) (laughs) So the family had to finally see what they've been kind of hearing about. (laughs) Yeah. And all my friends I grew up with. That was a lot tougher because I really didn't care if the family, it was, you know, liked it or not. I could care less, you know. (laughs) It's only family. But my, you know, yeah, I could care less. I'm just like, you didn't do nothing for me when I was around. So, But anyway, but the one that was really tough was the kids I grew up with. Oh, boy. That oh. was a tough one. <laughs> but they accepted it. Well, yeah, if you want to hear a little bit of the story. Sure. Uh, it was the reunion. It was, uh, it was the 40th. And uh, Lori knew and everything. And so I said, okay, I'm going to the 40th reunion. And I did. I went... The first thing I had to do was my cousin Amy set up a lunch with the family at the Marriott, and I had a beautiful dress. I had my hair done. I looked, not to brag, but I looked really, really great. <laughs> and it was like, and boom. The family accepted me with open arms. I was t- quite shocked. Yeah. I was like, wow. And then you find out who's gay on the family that no one talked about. Oh, <laughs> my cousin, this, that, you too? Yeah, wow. Ow. It's a surprise. Yeah. Well, it's like, well, the queer gene runs on my mom's side of the family. <laughs> They're all singers and dancers and artists. And you had to be the first one to no, say. No, and my cousin said that. My cousin said that. They go, boy, you got pushed all the way over the fence. I said, yeah, I got to grow boobs and things, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, was like, I said, I couldn't be happy like you guys. <laughs> so, 
it was really great. And then, but the hard one was my two oldest and dearest friends, Glenn and Stephanie. Uh, we were in the seventh grade talent show together, and we have had our little band and everything. And so that was a tough one. And so I got to the reunion. I was like, oh, my God, this is really going to happen. I was like, I'm not going in there. But so next thing you know, they, they grabbed me on each arm. And I said, yes, you are. So I go into the first person I seen was this girl I remember. Her name was Karen Valentine. And I, she, I went over to her, and she looked up my name tag. And I said, no, oh, your name is you're Karen Valentine. You got married to Gary Salino back in high school. Blah, blah, blah. I knew everything. And she, me and her were like, bros i mean yeah. we were tight yeah and she's looking at my name tag because it said my new first name and my real last name gaccioni yeah and so she's looking at me and then she's looking at my name tag she's looking at me looking at my name tag and she goes do you have a brother <laughs> <laughs> and i was like uh karen no this used to be jimmy she goes, oh my god so she looked at me really surprised and she looks at me and she goes you look great bitch <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, I felt better. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, that went pretty good. Yeah. She goes, I'm still married to Gary. You want to, you want to talk to us? I said, no, not yet. <laughs> Please let me kind of get into little. the water a little bit. Toes at a time. So then next thing you know, so then we go into the, the where they had the tables where you eat. And next thing you know, there they are. And they're all sitting around the table. I'm like, oh no. And then Carolyn, she was the mouthy one. She's looking at, and she's looking at me. She goes, well, you're finally right. And I looked at him. I said, what are you talking about? She goes, she goes, Jamie, you've always been one of the girls, but we didn't say nothing back then. I said, you all knew? Mm -hmm. She goes, yeah. You did more girl things than boy things. I was like, you guys rock. <laughs> <laughs> so that was our 40th. Now we're, this year I go back, uh, this summer I go back. I play the last week in July at Tremaze. And this is number 46 coming up, our 46th wow. uh, reunion. And six years of us playing every year. It's been really a blast. And I'm glad that it turned out to be such a positive experience because I read that it's estimated that 44% of transgender people have attempted suicide. They are three times as likely to be unemployed due to discrimination, and 31% lack access to regular medical care, either because they lack employment or they're worried doctors won't understand how to treat them. How, in your opinion, can we turn these statistics around, and what do we need to do as a culture? Well, first thing is this, you know, we don't have any support, so that's the first thing. And we get a lot of hatred, especially from people who are homophobic or transphobic, as we call it. And the other thing is... Uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of us that are being you know killed and targeted, um, and there's really not much you're going to do about that. But what people have to understand is that you know, yeah, we lose everything. Okay, we have no no help whatsoever. So the thing is, I seem it myself. I got so depressed. I had to finally do this. I couldn't take it anymore. I didn't have the money to do this. I didn't have the means. I lost job. I my, had no health care, you know, so what I did was I started out, I went to the farmer's market at 5.30 in the morning, sat in the middle of the street, played, the next thing you know it, one thing led to the next, I get a call from, about teaching, and I was really surprised that Guitar Center called me, I was really shocked, so I went there in full regalia, looked as pretty as could be. And when I went in there, they rushed me into the office and said, we want you to join our team. And I looked at them and I, I said, are you okay with this? They go, that's why we want you. You're good for our company. Mm -hmm. I was like, wow. And so I've been there. I have benefits. And that was got my start. The next thing you know, this wonderful lady named Cara, uh, Cara uh, Inglefield now, she just got married. And uh, she was a, our local singer. And she got me back out playing again. She says, would you play guitar for me at some gigs? Well, next thing you know it, she got me back into the fold. Mm -hmm. And I was different. Now, all of a sudden, here I am, right back what I was doing before. But now, all of a sudden, I'm getting called from women. I get, it's networking with women now. Mm -hmm. I get calls from wonderful, wonderful women who play. And I'm like, this is terrific. I've waited 50 years for this. <laughs> You have no idea. I am so happy now. It's like the next thing you know, I can't wait to get up in the morning. Before it was like, I just want to die. I can't go another day with this crap. You know, I don't know what to do. You know, now I get excited. I can't wait to go teach. I can't wait to play gigs. I can't wait 
to pick out the outfit I'm going to play yeah. with a matching guitar, you know. Now, any of those people that uh, dismissed you after the transition, like places like of employment, have they since called you or are you done? Funny you should say that, too, uh, because after now it's been this is my eighth year. And now all of a sudden my old people, my old life friends and all the people who knew me before, they're starting to come around, mm -hmm. you know. And it's really neat to have somebody who kind of knows you a long time and, you know, come up to you and go, wow, are you dating? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I'm happy now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so yes, it comes slowly but surely. I, I still uh, the music store I was at, uh, folks, music. Me and Gwen were very, one of my oldest dearest friends, and and uh, so we're working again together and uh, stuff like that. So, so you were gracious about it. You didn't say you snubbed me, so forget no, it. No, not at all. I mean, because I think it's kind of nice that I can finally go back to my my roots, and mm -hmm. you know that's where I came from, and these are people, and the same thing now with the these churches you know all of a sudden i'm getting calls to to speak i do big conventions i did one in atlanta the scc conference which was uh, thousands of trans people meet every year and i played and performed and i did my talk you know and it's great and now all of a sudden i have kids uh, young people in my my area in sarasota we have trans people from 12 to 70. i was did a talk at a church in bradenton and this older gentleman came up at the end of the the the, uh, the math the service, and said, "Jamie, I didn't know you were going to be our special guest speaker." He says, "I had some issues, and you really helped me with them today." And I just felt like I was a hundred feet tall, yeah. you know, because finally there's somebody that we can talk to about this. You know, I've talked with the Democrat conventions in the, in Tampa, and the same thing. They, you know, luckily they're giving me a chance to to see that. We're not monsters. We're not crazy. We're not sick. And so now I go to churches and I do the same thing. Now I got a few new churches that I'm going to be going to. So I feel like I'm leaking in. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm yeah. leaking in the show. Once they get to know me, the people are okay, you know. And so that's what they have to do is just give us a chance, you know. Now, don't get me wrong. There's crazy ones out there. There's crazy everything out there. Yeah. You got extremists and everything, you know. Mm -hmm. So, but now, luckily, I'm so glad and blessed that I can, you know, finally be myself. I am just happy as could be, you know. And it's like, and, you know, I have friends of mine. I have girlfriends. And they're they're not going to make really great passable women. And it doesn't matter. But they're so happy. And they're doing what they want to do. And so people have to just get over it. You know, it was like, hey, what does it matter? You know, so as long as we can just be nice, <laughs> you know, it was always I was braced with you know, if you can't say something nice, don't say nothing at all. Yeah. You know, it's so. good advice. Now, what advice would you give to people who may be finding that their identity is different from the one they were born with? Well, the first thing is they need to get to their local chapter of your 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 the gay services uh they're in the you know phone book and yellow pages uh in sarasota it's called also a youth and uh you can go there they will give you help if you get thrown out of your house and i got a lot of young ones 20 18 year olds once they come out they're done they're in the streets uh in uh, st petersburg uh, a wonderful place called metro uh where we have places where they can live until you know they can get back get back on their feet and get through you know back into society so there's a lot that now that that we didn't have when i was growing up i had nothing you know mm -hmm. so there is but you have to get involved and look for the local lgbtq community i said and they'll give you all the support you get you know you get all the help you need and the best thing is that they're there to educate the parents i had uh, a lady call me about her son he was like 12 years old and so when they came over and and i talked to little benji and mm -hmm. and uh you know and so next thing you know it and we were laughing i whispered in his ear and he started laughing he whispered in my ear and we start laughing you know and what we're laughing about is that it's like you put on your sister's toes, he goes yeah I said, I did the same thing. <laughs> and we talk about it. And it's so funny. Here's somebody I've never even met before, but we have the same story. I mean, yeah. the, the same thing. It's 12 years old. It was like, and we're laughing and this and that, you know. And she says, wow, I've never, never seen him be so happy and smile. I said, well, because there's somebody to talk to that doesn't 
what he's it going gets through. It. Yeah. And so next thing you know, so the mom would feel better. The father had a problem with it. Of course, the dads do, you know, because they don't understand. They're just, they, that's that macho boy thing that they have mm. to live with, you know. <laughs> and it's like, oh, oh, my son. What does it matter? You have a daughter. You didn't lose anything, you know. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's really nice now that I meet, uh, I had this wonderful, uh, I get a lot of the LGBT kids where I teach now because they know I'm there. And I like that. I think that's pretty spectacular that they can finally have a person like me in the community that, you know, they don't have to be afraid, you know, and they can take lessons from me. I have this one. And there's a lot more female to male than there is male to female. <laughs> Huh. three to one yeah and so i got off quite a few of them it was really funny i had this one uh, young lady and she was you know was going through her difficulties and it was really funny though because her mom was shocked when i said well i'm trans and she was like you're kidding it's like no so next thing you know it uh she they had to stop taking lessons and six months later i had to go do a um, a, a band camp and next thing you know there he was yeah haircut down and look i went wow yeah. i said i am so proud of you she goes thank you you helped a lot you know Aww. i was like wow and she was, I was like i could have never tell that she was, was a girl <laughs> it was really good so but the thing is people have to just get to the point where say hello you know don't just hate us because you know we we are this way you know uh, give us a chance that's it mm. Jamie, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom, your experience with us. I want to get back to the music front for just a bit and ask, what's next for you? Well, I'm doing it. There's nothing really next. I'm finally happy and at peace with the universe and the world and everything. I really love my playing more and teaching and helping and doing stuff in the community to help other people get along with, with the same same type of phobia and i do i've been doing what i do for the last 50 years you know i get to travel i get to see great places i get to work with great people and this is it this is i this is what i do yeah. now where can people go to find out more about you <laughs> okay you go to my facebook page it's on the j-a-m-i-g-e-e -E on facebook page i always list where i'm playing at uh i've been at uh, tsunamis which is downtown sarasota 100 central avenue and i've been there three and a half years now the people there are wonderful and i have a very nice uh crowd of people that come to see me play there and I bring in quite a diverse group. Uh, one night I had bikers, I had country bumpkins, I had gay people, I had trans people, and we were all getting along. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, well, thank you so much for joining us today. You're going to stick around and give us a live performance yeah, in a moment. I'm going to play a little bit for And you. very exciting, but thank you so much Good. for this well, thank interview. Thank you for having me, Daniel. Thank you so much. <laughs> 